Jack. Levi. The Book Club from Hell. Hello everyone, this is Jack with The Book Club from Hell, a hyper-invasive surveillance initiative which places recording thoughts into listeners' heads and uses these abstract forms to extract unsellable data. This episode is a special one. It is our first author interview. Given the prestige of appearing on The Book Club from Hell, Levi and I had our pick of authors to bring on the show. As a result, we picked the most famous and well-respected author in the world, me. I am the author being interviewed this episode. And why is that? Well, I just published my first novel, called Tower, and I want to advertise it. It's currently available as an ebook and a paperback on Amazon and iBooks. Links in the show notes. To give you a taste of what's in the book, here's the blurb. We have chased meaning away. In its place grows the tower, always expanding and leaving blissfully fulfilled employees in its wake. I am a doctor who specialises in souls. A potent advertising slogan leaves ripples in the world of the spirit. Love is remembered. Maybe S was responsible for everything, but who else do I have? Blending Franz Kafka, Mikhail Bulgakov, Jacques Ellul, and Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl, Tower is a search for meaning in a world no longer organised for humans. So, if you're ready to learn more about Tower, then listen on. Enjoy. I think I need to get over my reticence to to advertise the book or try to pump up things that I've made because I do want people to buy it and I do want to make money from it. That's the only reason I wrote it. Yeah, which is a pretty reasonable thing. Just trying to make cash. You've spent like how many hundreds of hours? It's just purely a cash grab. It's purely a cash grab, yeah. (laughs) There's no artistic merit. (laughs) No, every single (laughs) single choice when it came to writing the book was made with how can I maximise the reader base in mind? (laughs) How can I write something with the broadest appeal possible? How can I, the broadest possible and how can I maximise my revenue per sale? So it's just like full of product placement. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And that that counterintuitively led me to the creative decision to make one of the major characters a tower that doesn't speak, (laughs) (laughs) an inanimate object. How do you feel now that we're coming up on uh, the publication date? Is it the 6th of November? Yeah. Something like that. I haven't said. Yeah. So Uh, if this this episode. So it's whenever this, when this episode releases, I'll just. I think this episode is. is is uh, scheduled to release on the 6th of November. Um, yeah. So, it, so it, in that case, that's the release date. It's, okay, it's so, been decided. And it's now like, it's now, I think it's the 25th today. 25th of October. Yeah. So we're coming up on about two weeks until you publish the book. How are you feeling? I was nervous because I've put a lot of effort into it and I've just, I've revised it so many times. So you read draft or version 15 so it's gone through 15 different versions and i read version three back yeah you read it very early on yeah when it was quite different yeah although it was long enough ago that i couldn't really tell the differences i was like oh yeah i vaguely remember this thing happening um but yeah to me it was largely uh felt like a fairly fresh read for the most part yeah it's changed a lot but yeah, I'm I'm nervous also because I've read it so many times. I just don't know if it's good or not anymore. It's it's just way too familiar. So I, I had <laughs> no real distance from it. Is it ever really finished, Jack? No, you just give up on it. <laughs> it's, I decided that version 15 was the final one because I just there are still problems. I just can't be bothered fixing them. I just truly do not try <laughs> ever read it again. Yeah. Well, our listeners who have been listening, anybody who's listened to episodes over sort of September, October of uh, 2023, uh, including like Decline of the West One, I think. Had, had yeah, a, definitely. Had, yeah. So um, we'll know that the book that we're referring to is your first novel, Tower, which you've been working on now for about two years, more or less. Um, you first started writing in 2020, did, did you? End of 2020? The timeline? The timeline's a bit disjointed. I started writing it in 
2019. Right. When I was working in Wangaratta at the hospital there. Right. I finished a draft in about a year and then lost interest and started writing other things and yep. then decided to come back to it and actually polish it up enough that I could, I could show it to other people. So I think I must have read it in 2020 or yeah. 20, maybe. No, I think I read it in ver- the version that I first read in the, must have been the summer between 2020 and 2021. For Southern Southern Hemisphere summer for yeah. our Northern real Hemisphere. Summer. Normal yeah, real summer. summer. <laughs> December um, summer. Yeah, so it's been a while. It's been a yeah, while. Yeah, I'd say it's probably been about two and a half years of of working on it. Dedicated work interspersed yeah. between all the other life things and that we've had and, you know, global pandemic and so forth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's quite momentously, the foundation of the book club from hell. Yeah, Against more which the, the entire pandemic pales in comparison. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In in the future, <laughs> it's uh, just a foot the thing that will be remembered from, from hell. From yeah, the twenty early twenty twenties will be um, the rise of the book club from hell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my first. So this it, this episode is going to be our first ever author interview. With, <laughs> the, with only the only author that we could get hold of, at least for this yeah. podcast, and the only one that we could actually convince to come on. Like, trust <laughs> us, we tried to bribe F. Gardner. We tried to bribe a bunch of other authors on. We were like, "Come on, we'll give you um, some cuck bucks. We'll give you like an Amazon gift card or something." Like, come on, they're like, "No, this 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 podcast is too obscure." Too weird. <laughs> I thought about demonstrating my artistic credibility by also refusing to come on the podcast. <laughs> You're like, it's beneath me. <laughs> yeah. I'm so, a really big deal now. <laughs> at Famous Author 2, because F. Gardner took Famous, famous Author, author 1. <laughs> F. Gardner has taken my rightful name on YouTube, Famous <laughs> Author. You should submit a complaint to YouTube be like, he's impersonating me. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to F. Gardner. It's not my name, <laughs> but it's my ontological role. <laughs> so this is very exciting for um, us as a podcast to have our one of our co-hosts, Jack, publish his first book, A Momentous Occasion. Um, and really interesting as well because uh, I guess we've been, as a podcast, um, like thinking about like, how we make this thing work into the future. And one of the things that we've sort of decided is that it would make sense that uh, we publish our own books, <laughs> at least yeah. one of us, certainly. Um, and so this is also a big, uh, a big thing in terms of Jack figuring out what, a, what it means to be like a, or how to be a self-published author and um, having our audience and this podcast is, uh, is something that will hopefully enable, enable Jack to be able to, be a sustainable self-publishing author. Um, so shout yeah, out to our audience fat for, stacks. Stack yeah, yeah, for helping us stack Satoshis. Um, anyways, so what are we going to do today in lieu of having our friend Mr. Ed <laughs> on the show because he has other life obligations which are far more important than <laughs> talking talking to us. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, he's, had a, he's had a son. Yeah, he's uh, which, replicated. <laughs> which which is perversely a, has come before appearing on the podcast. <laughs> he really needs to get his priorities straight. Yeah. <laughs> Can I do an anti-shout out to Ed? <laughs> 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 yeah, although Ed and I think we, like, I mean, it depends how he wants to do it. But um, if he still wants to come on the show and me and Ed will do like a normal book review episode of Jack's book <laughs> without Jack around. Yeah. Um, but in lieu of doing that, we're going to do uh, an interview. I'm going to interview Jack. This is our first episode, our first interview episode for the podcast. It's very exciting. And uh, Jack's first book, so lots of momentous, uh, important occasions that should overshadow both a global pandemic and our friend having a child. I'll put some <laughs> air horn clips when I'm editing this. <laughs> do, do, do. Just to really, really emphasize the big, big dog. Big <laughs> so... Um, before we jump into it, Jack, do you have any 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 preambles to make or anything, or should we just jump into add, 
I'm actually more nervous for this episode than any other episode, even though I didn't have to read anything for it, because it, it just... Self-promotion doesn't come naturally. Yeah, to and, Australians in general, but especially yeah. to Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it's uh, it's good. It's a, I think it's an important skill to develop um, if you obviously want to be an author, but especially a self-published author. Being able yeah, to, if you want to actually sell things. Yeah, so growth yeah, mindset, get on all that, that good get stuff. Get that warrior skull Tony Robbins mindset. <laughs> all right, well, let's jump into it. First question, what is the story about at a high level? The story of Tower at a high level is about... So the, the main character is a doctor whose specialty is the treatment of souls, which within this world is a discipline that's highly empirical, not very well understood, but nonetheless important. Living in a city where a, a company has become so large, has such hopes and attention invested in it that it's become self-aware and began to manifest itself in the world as a tower that keeps growing larger and larger into the sky and slowly absorbing the world around it. That's it at a very high level. Yeah. And we can obviously in post remove any spoilers or whatever if you let something slip. Um, but we don't need to uh, unpack it too much more than too that. Too much, think, yeah. Cause I, I think that's a good one. I think that's a good one. I think that's fine. I, I, I take plot really seriously in, yeah. in novels and I don't want to give too much away. Yeah, yeah. It's a really good story, though. Um, so I've just finished reading it over the weekend, and I thought it was excellent. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Jack's embarrassed. He's like, damn it. <laughs> just sh- start showering you with uh, with compliments and praises so you, you just get all unable to respond. <laughs> Catch by start surprise. vomiting into the microphone. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it was excellent. I really enjoyed it. Um it was a really strange book. <laughs> <laughs> I must admit. Uh, my ultra-focus group testing approach didn't work. <laughs> what was interesting about it was um, some of the themes that you were addressing, which um, obviously as a personal friend, I sort of understood where they were coming from, from like where you were at your life and at that point, in your, sorry, where you were at that point in your life. I was wondering if you could uh, tell us about some of the m- maybe major themes of uh, of the book. In terms of major themes, there are there are probably two major themes. So one of them is the relationship between work and meaning. A lot of this is probably due to my class, in that you know, I'm of the university educated white collar class within which a large number of people, and a lot of our friends, or most of our friends now, enter into corporate jobs or professional jobs, and within that paradigm, seek meaning. And so a lot of the book is exploring to what extent is that, can that venture be successful? Can you truly find meaning within an organisation like that in a way that will fulfil you to the same extent as for example, creating something for yourself or having children or having some sort of spirituality. The other thing is a more recent preoccupation. So this wasn't something I was worried about when I began writing the book, but which developed during writing it, is the effect of technique or of, or of technology on human beings. Those particularly inspired by Jacques Ellul and, and Lewis Mumford, who were Two people, I think they influenced the Unabomber, which is how I became aware of them. I read the Unabomber Manifesto first for this podcast. The both of them explored what what does it mean for humans to create technology? What if and what effect does it have on people? And the effect it has is much more significant than the sort of superficial analysis that's presented much of the time today, that that machine or machines might make us behave in different ways because of the conveniences they provide or in some rare cases, for example, with the constant hand ring over social media, you might have some sort of quote unquote evil technologies that make us behave in what's seen to be a perverse way. But the assumption in all of those, with all of those viewpoints, or probably the mainstream view of technology, is that humans are unchanged 
they are just induced to behave in certain ways because of the existence of technology. Whereas the two authors I just referenced had quite a different view, whereas they, they believe that the technical impulse itself very, very profoundly alters how human beings view the world and view themselves. And so a lot of this book is also exploring that. Yeah, and you did an, an excellent job <laughs> of exploring <laughs> both of those themes. Um, I've now I've superseded Alul and Mumford. <laughs> they are no longer relevant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the note of authors, including Mumford and Alul, you also mentioned uh, a few other authors on the blurb. Uh, who were those authors um, and how did those authors and any others um, inform the writing of Tower? I'm pretty sure on the blurb I reference Jacques Ailul. I also reference Mikhail Bulgakov, Franz Kafka, and Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl, the literary sensation. In terms of, so both Kafka and Bulgakov largely write within a realist paradigm, but will slip in just these really, really bizarre elements that don't make sense, that don't seem to fit with the world, and use that to, to, to explore interesting questions about the nature of bureaucracy, of society, religion, etc. So there's, there's a lot of that. Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl was much more of an atmospheric influence in that I'd, the, <laughs> yeah. the atmosphere in that game is just really, really oppressive yeah. and dark. And I found that a big inspiration, particularly the things in that game that are threatening or, or seem supernatural at first blush oftentimes have at least the hint that there is there was some act of human creation involved in them at some point. So something like the Brain Scorcher or Radar. They're seemingly supernatural, but once you get close enough to them, it's, it strikes you as, no, this is more strange Soviet-era technology that's just gained a mind of its own and gone off in its own direction. Those were big influences. Something I don't think I mentioned, no, I def- didn't mention in the blurb, was also the extent to which this has been influenced by black metal and death metal. Mm. Particularly the band. particular, yeah. Yeah, particularly the band Yellow Eyes. Yeah. Where there, there's just a character in the book, which is named after that which, band. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> Huge shout out to Yellow Eyes. Fantastic <laughs> band. <laughs> yeah. And as, as with Stalker, those are more atmospheric influences. It was, it's Yellow Eyes and then the album Celestial by Isis, which has a song called The Tower. <laughs> Actually, all through the book, there are just continuous references to metal bands. I won't. I won't name any more specifics, but there, there are a lot of references to like lyrics, song titles, things like that. So if you're enough of a degenerate to like metal and to read my book, you're probably going to notice a lot of these things in there. <laughs> <laughs> and so, what about? Are there any parts of the book that you feel confident? Um, how would I put this? A not a, a not. Well, I suppose I'd say like uh, original, and you don't feel as though are uh, sort of derived from or inspired extremely heavily by others. That you feel as though is a unique part for for you, like your your contribution. Obviously, the entire book on some level, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's really. That's really hard to answer. So all I think all fiction f- fundamentally is autobiographical because you don't have anyone else's experience. It's just your own experiences run through a blender. And the, the degree to which they outwardly resemble your life is, is itself probably a reflection of your own psyche. I guess then the question is to what extent is that autobiographical nature inspired by others? I don't know, I don't know if I'm making sense. That's really hard to answer. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, I gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Levi's won the interview. <laughs> the rest of my questions are just going to be sharper and sharper. <laughs> Levi destroys hapless, blue-pilled, cuckold author using facts and logic. <laughs> um, we spoke about 
so during um your writing of of tower at a number of points we we sort of spoke about how you're going obviously uh and you made this interesting point in one of those conversations that you felt as a, well i found it an interesting point because it's fiction but you said that you were trying to solve a problem which i found interesting i've never heard that set of fiction before um what problem or problems were you trying to solve when you were writing tower were the problems that you were trying to solve at the end of writing tower the same ones that you were trying to solve at the beginning yeah i, do, I remember saying that to you actually um i this the problem i was trying to solve when i began writing tower was can you to what extent can you find meaning in work and particularly in work that other people give you rather than something you've created for yourself? And then I forget which draft number exactly it was, but maybe halfway through the the series of revised drafts, it started to also be about living in an, an increasingly technicized time. I don't think either of those, either of those questions were, answered for me but i did come a long way in in working out what i thought of those two two things writing's a really really good way to work out your own feelings about a particular topic yeah also because a novel allows you to explore things with a degree of of resolution that sort of writing a two-page very declarative statement or piece of writing doesn't allow you mm mm and so I, uh, I don't think this is giving too much away. Um, and I, I don't think you necessarily gave answers in the book. Like I felt as though the conclusion of the book was left open enough to, for me to ponder a lot of these things. You didn't sort of like tell the reader how to think about it, at least in my, um, my opinion. Um, but for yourself, where are you having now finished the book? Uh, where are you sitting at with those two problems, the problem of work and meaning and the, the problem of technology? So in terms of technology, I've kept writing about that. I'm writing a, man, a first draft now, which is much, much more focused on technology. In terms of meaning and work, I'd, like, I did stop working as a doctor. so. It did have it did have an influ- influence on me in that respect, in that I decided to start trying to make, trying to find meaning in work that I've made for myself, rather than being given tasks by someone else, and looking for meaning in that. So I guess that that was a fairly big development. I don't I don't know if it was entirely because of writing this book, but I'm sure it had an influence. And uh, if you listen, if our listeners listen to um, our Carl Jung episode, we discuss some things quite similar, in particular creative work. I would say that a lot of doctors would probably not consider medicine a creative field, although obviously if you're in R&D, for example... Mm. Um, there's obviously aspects of medicine that are creative. I guess you'd say clinical medicine then. Yeah, clinical medicine. I I don't think a lot of doctors would really consider that a creative thing to do. I could probably think of some exceptions maybe, like, for example, like maybe very strange cases, like very rare cases or something where there's like an investigative component. But most doctors or most clinical doctors are probably not going to say it's a creative field. Having now transitioned from... A non-creative profession to um, writing your own book and publishing your own book, um, and in reference to our Carl Jung discuss- discussion about creativity, um, h- how has that been for you? How do you feel about now trying to live a life and have a career that's more based on creativity rather than, say, tasks? There are a few different aspects. So there are. There are practical aspects that are just much harder. Like it's it's less financially rewarding. Uh, <laughs> which which bring, cashed up cashed up self publishing author on on Amazon. 
I find it more fulfilling, but I think different people find fulfillment in different things. So I, I don't think that's all that generalizable. I also think the line, the line between creative work and more, I wouldn't say it's rote work, but more structured work is is blurred. It's not a binary distinction. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because so much creative work, at least to me, seems to be it's problem solving under a set of a set of constraints. They just happen to be constraints almost that you've imposed on yourself or that you've you've discovered by pursuing some particular plot thread or character in your mind. That there are certain things that you can put into a story that makes sense within the context of the story and certain things that don't make sense or are wrong. And oftentimes, especially once you know the characters and the world within a story well enough, it turns almost into an engineering problem of what what is the one thing, or you try to narrow it down to one truest thing towards which the story can go that is true or makes sense versus everything else. So that's not the same as... It's not completely the same as treating a patient where ideally there is going to be a course of action you take that is best for the patient. But I also don't think it's fundamentally different. So both both of them are operating, are trying to find a best path within a, a system of constraints. Yeah. I suppose on some level, though, and maybe you have something to say about this, hopefully, <laughs> um, is as the creative, I, I suppose, the captain of that ship within a uh, creative work, you can also set the criterion. Yeah, you find the constraints, which is nice. Yeah. What was that process like, for discovering those constraints and criterion criteria? For Tower. In so with Tower, this is the first thing I'd written. The first creative thing that I'd written since probably high school. So especially the early parts of writing it were just writing chapters because I thought it was fun. And through that process, getting to know the characters and the world that they lived in. And once I'd built up enough intuitions about who or what the things in the story were, then then being able to pursue it more concretely in the way that I was saying earlier, where certain things just make sense and certain things don't. So Carl Jung, (laughs) I won't (laughs) reference that episode too much, but Carl Jung distinguishes between uh, what he calls, I I believe he said psychological fiction and visionary fiction, if I can remember the terminology correctly, uh, for a very long discussion about that, (laughs) please Go yeah, and we had a Carl really Jung. long talk, like uh, three and a half hours. Yeah, on Carl Jung's uh, Mon Man in Search of a Soul. Um, how would you classify Tower? And um, could you please explain why you would classify it like that? I would say more it's not psychological rather than is visionary in the sense that <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't start writing it with the intention of psychoanalyzing myself. And I don't think... I don't think that the characters or the themes are me looking at, intentionally looking at my own life and trying to work out my psychological motivations for things like that, which, is, which seems to be at least a large part of how Jung defines psychological fiction. Also, just so listeners are aware of what's going on, he contrasted psychological fiction with visionary fiction, which he felt was a type of fiction which wasn't aiming to consciously analyse the psyche of the person writing it, but instead was was this emergent phenomenon where the author or painter or sculptor or whoever is creating a particular piece of art simply follows the creative process without much conscious awareness or conscious steering of where it should go and in doing so reveals something of the collective unconscious. In the sense that I, I wasn't, I didn't really know where the story would end up, and I wasn't trying to psychologically analyze all of the characters. It's not psychological. The extent to which it represents the collective unconscious is probably a judgment that someone who's not me can make. I, just, <laughs> just I don't have like, enough. From this yeah, movie. of course, it was a visionary piece of work. <laughs> <I'm> a, <laughs> I am an artistic genius. I am a visionary. <laughs> this is a 
deep and penetrating look into the soul of the Western the Western man in the 21st <laughs> century. <laughs> uh, for my for my next book, because you know, I get with self publishing, you get to design the the jacket and things like that. I really want to quote myself saying <laughs> that the book is dazzling and penetrating and things like that and that'll be the entire blurb on the back just me quoting myself about how good the book is uh so funny um didn't do that for tower unfortunately yeah yeah <laughs> but at least and with I can't the next one you can say doing the jacket now you can like reference yourself and you can say like author of tower <laughs> <laughs> Um, what was, um, and again, I, uh, I guess you can cut out this question if you feel as though it's, um, revealing too much. Uh, but I, First there was some, how good it was out of 10, <laughs> 100, <laughs> um, there was some parts that I really enjoyed, which I, I guess I can talk about, um, either with you or with Ed, but I was wondering what was the, um, what was the most fun thing part or whatever of the book uh for you to write so it probably two things one is in general just being able to write something and realize that this reflects badly on me realize that i could just make stuff without asking for people's permission because i'd gone through you know, 13 years of of school and then a further seven years of university so i'm, I'm a highly Formatted. institutionalized creature highly formatted and, little yeah little so being able, <laughs> being able to realize that i'm able to just make things without asking people whether i can or can't make them or being explicitly told to do them and to do them according to a set of criteria was really good so yeah that's so strange, at a non-particular eh? level that was that's probably the most fun part of the book that's such a weird thing I wonder how many people in the world feel like that. I was actually having. Sorry, I'll let you answer the second part. No, no, I'm just go gonna on. like weave in some other stuff. Um, I was, I've been speaking to my partner a lot recently about entrepreneurship and um, starting our own business and that sort of stuff um, in the next like couple of years. And obviously, like I'm doing this with Jack, and um, but now she's thinking of like, okay, well, could she start? Um, what was it called moonlighting or whatever, like, or or make our own product or something like that? And she's like, "Yeah, it just feels so weird to try to do something without like being told to do it by mm. a boss or without like asking." It. Like, she kind of has this weird like, and I I, I know what she means because I've had this at moments too, although I'm getting over it. I think of um needing like some sort of permission or validation from yeah. some external structure or authority yeah, to say absolutely. like you can go and do this thing <laughs> i think that's um at least partially attributable to being in a very like high compliance like our education system rewards compliance very strongly yeah absolutely that's the compliance prime thing that <laughs> i would reward. imagine yeah <laughs> so breaking as as jack has used i love this term de did you say deformatting or unformatting yourself or defragging yourself <laughs> I don't think I ever. I've, I've, I've oh, is that my that people get formatted? I don't think I ever bothered coming up with a an idea. Well, of I, I call that. it unformatting, defragging. <laughs> yep, <laughs> defrag yourself. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? It's been cool to see you um, figure that out over the last couple of years. Um, yeah. So you back to what you were saying. You're answering the question. Oh, yeah. the second <laughs> half. <laughs> in terms of more concrete things that were really fun to write in the book, there's. I mean, they're kind of one character, but in multiple bodies. The high performers were really, really fun I, I to write. Loved, I love the high performers. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Just so much fun. <laughs> people, as soon as they, they either become employed by this particular company in Tower or they buy shares in the company, there's a certain chance if they're male and haven't hit puberty yet that they'll start becoming like they'll grow a blue through a blue suit through their skin all start looking exactly the same and start behaving in exactly the same really really boisterous friendly aggressive somewhat threatening or increasingly threatening way okay, and like and become a member of the high of performers high machismo 
like high yeah. energy sort of <laughs> high test, yeah, high, high energy, test. <laughs> and they were they were really really fun to write, yeah. And that was a they or it was a great character in the book, <laughs> a lot of fun. So them or scenes when things get more psychedelic were yeah. also really really enjoyable to write. How and there are a it? number of scenes like that, and they get more frequent as the book goes on. Yeah, <laughs> how um. Was it challenging writing the psychedelic scenes? No, those came really naturally. <laughs> Maybe I've just taken too much acid during my life. <laughs> they seemed pretty natural to write. <laughs> Did you take any of those scenes from actual trips that you've had or they were just inspired by? No, just inspired by. Yeah. I think I tried to capture that feeling of disorientation. Mm. Of disorientation and meaning being written in everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of taking yeah. psychedelics. But no, I've, I've never like talked to a tower or anything like that. <laughs> there was one scene where <laughs> one of the main characters was like staring at a wall. For, <laughs> and you're like, yeah, for like however long you're staring at a wall for. So that's like, ah, he's on acid. <laughs> 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 so good. Um, what, what was the, uh, what was, the most difficult part of writing the book? Definitely edits. Edits are, edits are really, really necessary to make a book good. But writing the first draft is really, really fun because you're getting to just throw out ideas. <laughs> Subsequent edits and especially making the book make sense to others because it makes a, made a whole lot of sense to me even when it didn't necessarily make sense to other people. That's, that's a lot more difficult and a lot more arduous or at least i found it as such highly rewarding because at the end you come out with something that that just works better but it takes a lot of effort to get there and then fucking editing for typos and things like that is just such a pain in the ass i just i hate doing that so much and did you do like full like read throughs yeah like several and so did you do like like sort of coarse grain restructures and then very like fine grained, like tightening up sentences and stuff. I suppose. What was your sort of like? Um, did you have any particular approach, or you just kept on hammering away at it until you felt like, okay, I'm fucking done? <laughs> the approach in Tower changed all over time. I've got a more. I've settled into a more regular workflow now. During Tower, the first. First draft was just writing stuff down without any sort of planning. Yep. And seeing what stuck. Subsequent edits ended up actually being I would make dot points to see what happened in each chapter and then rewrite stuff based on dot points. And then once I was happy with the order of events according to dot points, I would then go and rewrite chapters based on those. Probably a big change came when I got it to a point where I wanted to have another set of eyes on it. And so I hired an editor for a developmental edit. And after that, I'd, I made some really, really significant changes. And that was hugely helpful. That was, mm. I think, completely necessary. Maybe there are some people who can write good novels without editorial support, but I'm definitely not one of those people. Having a good, experienced set of eyes who don't you know that that don't know anything about the story on your story is just so so valuable mm. um so my next question is kind of i suppose like we could i'll separate it out into like the general version of it and then the version more specifically about tower if it makes any sense otherwise you can just treat it as one question if you want um but what have you learned from actually having now written your first book and then more specifically have you learned anything from writing tower in particular Learned a lot of really good practical skills for for writing novels, and then I haven't published it yet, but you know, hopefully all that goes smoothly. So a number of lessons about self-publishing. In terms of writing novels, I've definitely I've worked out a workflow that works really, really well for me. So Tower's all done. I've got another I've got a draft, I think draft seven or eight of another manuscript that probably needs one more revision and I'll send it off to an editor to get some feedback, which I, I doubt will be published within like 12 months of this episode. That'll be a while. 
So that the method I just I just went over of basically writing plot in terms of dot points and then rearranging the plot or writing doing rewrites of the plot of dot points rather than full sentences and then coming in and actually writing a chapter completely fairly late is something that I've I've come to during the process of writing tower and then subsequent manuscripts so that that was really good I think I learned to, how to read other people's books in a different way and when I say read other people's books in a different way, I mean just like steal sentence structures that I like or particular turns of phrase. That's really good. I think that's a that's a really really good really practical effort, way to improve the writer. <laughs> it's just just steal, steal shit from other people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, this is a really well written sentence here. I might just um, <laughs> just yeah, it I'll make it look bit. a little bit different and pass it off as my own. <laughs> <laughs> there's that stuff also just realizing that writing these things takes so much longer than you think and writing something each day without worrying too much about how much progress you're making in the context of the entire book okay, this is probably more f- phenomenological than it it's like it truly is less time but it feels like it takes less time and effort you just keep plugging away at writing a bit each day and then one day you realise, oh, I've got a draft done. Rather than constantly worrying about how how much more time you're going to have to be writing for. I'm just kind of spitballing these things. There's not, not any real order to these lessons I've learned. In terms of the practicalities of self-publishing, actually, that was pretty good. It was back to what you were saying before about how when you're doing something for yourself, there's one of the difficulties that you had to push through and which I certainly had to as well is this sense that something almost doesn't exist if you don't have institutional validation of it mm-hmm. if, if you don't have a boss or an organization saying this is the task you should do or good job for doing this task that I've set you and I found that initially I was trying quite hard to find a literary agent who would then hopefully be able to get tower published Give me that traditionally bit of validation that little bit of yeah, <laughs> a little bit of and, a gold star or whatever. <laughs> yeah, and I, the more I learn or have learned about traditional publishing, the more I don't think that business model makes sense. Especially when, like, you've got print on demand services, and you can build a platform for yourself, like with podcasting, like with the <laughs> the globe spanning empire that is the book club from hell, global phenomena. Like yeah. we literally, I mean, <laughs> listeners don't know this, but sometimes we'll just be like, I'll just be driving around in like a random city somewhere in the world as I gallivant around the globe and I'll just get out of like the car and I'll just be mobbed by a, a yeah. sea of women <laughs> and just, is oh my God, Levi is that out loud? Levi out loud from the book club from hell? <laughs> 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 oh my God, he's so beautiful and charismatic. <laughs> And you know, well, if there's I have anything to say, we know about our listener base, our fan base, I should over, say, overwhelmingly, it is that they're they're overwhelmingly female, overwhelmingly fem- not even fan base, really, like acolytes, I would say, acolytes, <laughs> harem, <perhaps. Our> thralls. <laughs> yeah, so this enormous so, platform that we can leverage to, to sell <laughs> to just stack sats by sell by selling very strange surrealist is it surreal like surrealist sci fi. <laughs> Psychedelic. Yeah, fiction. I don't even. I actually should work out what sort of genre this book is. It's because it, it's it definitely sci-fi. has a lot of sci-fi. It's sci-fi yeah. for sure, but that's a very low resolution classification because it's not like any other sci-fi I've read. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot more talk of souls than in other sci-fi books. Yeah, I've because read. of that, I, I almost felt like at times it was more like fantasy or something. So like, hmm. um, yeah, it's it's a weird mixture. Um, of sci-fi with, and what's, is it, um, like, yeah, surreal? Would you call it surreal? Like surrealist or something? I'm not sure. Man. Look, it's heavily LSD inspired. <laughs> <laughs> but LSD is not an accepted genre. It's like, um, it's like the literary instantiation of prog rock. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, let me see. What was I saying? Oh, yeah, that 
that you don't in 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 terms of lessons learned when it comes to the publishing process is that we'll see we'll see how this goes this experiment with self publishing might fail miserably but i i think it actually makes a lot more sense for first time or for debut novelists to build up their own platform and sell directly to listeners or to to people who consume other things on their platform rather than going for the traditional method yeah apart from anything else like the volume of sales you need to make to make the same amount of money is just ridiculous like 5x with, more. when comparing traditional like and that. self-publishing at least 5x sorry more. oh more more than so off off ebooks on amazon i get 70 percent of the sales price with traditional publishing it's you're more looking at like three to five percent yeah so more than 10x <laughs> 15x yeah <laughs> yeah so you need to sell 15 times as many copies yeah i suppose that and, and you know like to be fair to traditional publishing like they do have that distribution at least if you're going with like a random house or something like that oh absolutely yeah they've got they've got a lot of additional costs but that's also why i say that I'm not convinced the economic model makes much sense, at least for, like, if you're Stephen King or something, sure, it probably makes a lot of sense. But for most people, and particularly debut novelists, who are, who are too high risk now for a lot of publishing houses or agents to touch, it, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, for sure. Um, and it's a really interesting experiment. I mean, even if... Um you just publish this and it gets some sales or whatever, like maybe for your next book or if you do a second edition of Tower, then maybe that will be a lot more, you know, if you still wanted to give traditional publishing a go. But I also think that like in terms of like if you can make it work, the self-published authors that I've listened to, it sounds like can also be very like, you know, obviously um, high high autonomy um, path to yeah. go down, obviously. <laughs> Which is good and bad because it means – so certain things like formatting your book, getting the artwork done, making the jacket, all those sort of things you have to worry about. And it's nice in that you get a lot of control over those things, but you also have to think about many more things. Yeah, for sure. So um, my next question uh, will allow you to s- <laughs> um, indulge slightly, <laughs> laughing, in, indulge slightly in your Australian self-flagellation. Um, what, what is uh, wh- what are you um, most unhappy about um, with the book? Uh, would you change it if you could? Um, and why or why not? The, the, given that this book is the platonic perfect form of a novel, <laughs> I don't think there's actually anything that could be changed <laughs> without making it worse. No, it, I'm too close to it. Like when I look at the book, I just see a whole bundle of problems yeah. that I know that if I, if I spent a lot more time on it, I probably could fix. It's just that I'd, I want to move on to other things. Yeah. And so I think I've I've moved this project as far as I can, or just as far as I'm willing to. Yeah, you don't have any more energy for it, I suppose. Um, yeah, in terms of problems, a lot of the problems came or stem from the fact that the initial drafts were the first pieces of creative writing I'd done since high school, and so a lot of drafts were just unfucking those. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the technical and I, I'm not sure it? to what extent. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure the, the verb to unfuck is really important here in describing the, the editorial process. I'm not sure to what extent other people will be able to see those problems, but because I've spent so much time with this book, I, I know exactly where they are and what they are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, that's probably for, for other people to judge. What about the part that you're most happy about with the book? Other than it being finished <laughs> and published on on its I was, I was exactly exactly <laughs> what I was going to say. I'm I'm proud of myself that I actually saw it through to completion. Yeah, well done. In terms of bits I'm happy with, I think the last third of the book, I'm I'm pretty happy with. That was the part that was most fun to write because that's the part that's the most disconnected from from everyday reality, <laughs> and <laughs> and there's the most psychedelic. So that was the most enjoyable because you just don't really have to worry about rules like 
<laughs> how physical reality <laughs> operates on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. <laughs> The sense of escalation in the book, I think, is is something I'm happy. Definitely with. peaks peaks super hard. <laughs> <laughs> Except it's not like one of those uh, acid trips where you peak around the four hour mark and then you have a nice like, you know, the hours four to six are like still pretty crazy, but like chilled a bit more, and then you have that nice like off ramp six to fourteen. Mm. Um, you, you this is like slamming mushroom tea. And then, and then just blacking out. Xanax because it's too much <laughs> and then you just black out. out at the end. We're at the peak psychedelic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, it's actually only talking about it out loud that I realise how much this has been influenced by drugs. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of there's <laughs> stuff in there about like amphetamines and um, yeah, like obviously medically related drugs. <laughs> so yeah, there's a lot of drug stuff in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, you probably get a better idea of what I'm like as a person beyond the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> what a uh, what advice um, would you give to anybody else? I can I, hmm, I assume this is the case that people listening to our podcast are probably interested in writing maybe not writing fiction or writing entire stories but you know we get people posting stuff on our discord like stuff that they've written little yeah, short shout out to yarp shout out to yarp probably and his short stories about <laughs> yukio mission <laughs> so good so it's a, yeah so like i guess if we're sitting here talking to yarp or you know one of our other listeners what advice would you give to them if they're thinking about um writing books in general and obviously more specifically writing fiction probably the, the most important thing is that you get better at writing by doing it. And so the the most important thing you can do is to write stuff. Yeah. It's probably it's individual. I've always liked doing a little bit of something of any long-term project each day. Yeah. And doing it regularly and I find I get the best results doing that. Some people seem to work best by just doing things in bursts. So find what works for you, but just do it. If you want to get better at writing fiction, write fiction. Maybe uh, there, there are probably books that are useful in that they tell you how to write better, and I'm sure I probably would have benefited from reading those or of, of, of sort of listening to anyone else rather than just writing stuff. <laughs> but I, I don't think there's any replacement for learning by doing. Yeah, same thing with coding. People are like, how do I learn to code? It's like, you code. <laughs> you sit down, you fucking code. Yeah. Like, sure, you can read a book or you can do a tutorial or something but at some point you've just got to start building something <laughs> yeah Could you, having said that yeah. actually there's a there, there will be a point in writing where you 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 don't have enough distance from the story mm. or from the characters to really know if it works or not and also to know to what extent it makes sense to a person who's not you because of course it's mm. going to make sense to you you came up with it mm. so there'll be a point at which an editor, particularly for a developmental edit, will be really, really valuable if you're if you're wanting to take the story further. If if it's just something you're writing for yourself and you you don't feel any need to publish, then it's a it's a less obvious the the answer to whether you should get an editor or not is is less obvious. But if you're wanting to publish it and to show it to other people, then getting an editor is really, really valuable. Extremely valuable. Because it's nice, it's nice having friends read it and then let you know what it's like. Quite often, friends friends will want to spare your feelings, so they're not going to be as harsh. Although, actually, <laughs> Levi read a very early version <laughs> and provided some very, very useful and very blunt feedback. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I remember feeling kind of bad because I was like, oh, I don't know, like I'm probably being a bit mean, but like I don't think I complimented no. you at all during that feedback session. I don't think I said no, a single. That was thing. actually really, really. <laughs> but I like the book. Very high yield. <laughs> yeah, but I was just like, I'm just going to stop on his fucking dreams. See if I could stop him. <laughs> stop writing. <laughs> Go back to medicine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if you have a friend like Levi who actually will tell you <laughs> the things that they don't like, then that is really valuable. But with, with editors, they'll combine being able to tell you if stuff just doesn't work with the experience of being able to suggest how you can improve it. So, yeah, that's, that's invaluable as well. Yeah, they're professionals, consummate professionals, unlike yeah. Levi who... 
doesn't know what he's doing and has no right to tell anybody else what to do with their writing, <laughs> except that it was Jack just asked for a favour. So, <laughs> Yeah, and that's the other thing too. It's it's a big ask to ask someone to read through, you know, like your 90,000 word manuscript. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. so <laughs> um, which Levi very kindly did. <laughs> um, so tell us a bit about the books that you're working on now. So there are two at the moment. So the one that will definitely come out first is called Hypernormal. And I've got draft number seven of it. I think I said earlier in this episode that I want to give it another revision and then we'll probably send it off to, to, the, uh, to, a, to an editor, hopefully the same editor who edited um, Tower, shout out to Nina Shiler, will have time to look over the manuscript for Hypernormal because she was excellent. And then on the basis of that, I'll do subsequent revisions and ho- hopefully have it out within the next two years from you know the, the date of recording now and in October 2023. And what's uh, that book is yeah. that book's about it's really good. So <laughs> in terms of in terms really of influences, good. the influences are mostly mathcore, like Dillinger Escape Plan or Botch <laughs> or Mouth Breather, political infotainment. Speed, and probably just the the paranoia during the the pandemic lockdown. So that all of the revisions of this book were written in lockdown. So it's dramatically more paranoid and has probably a more cooped up, like an animal pacing its cage feeling than Tower. And it's about a right wing band called Atlas and the Shruggers, who are so incredibly popular that they are effectively global government. That they. <laughs> they have a process of of deciding for governmental policies whereby they they'll release an album and each song will represent a different policy proposition whichever song gets the most streams will decide policy direction That's so and it's good. about <laughs> each band member each band member is less a person than a product or a a crude caricature of an ideology and much of the story is about them developing as human beings rather than as pure political consumption. <laughs> There's a lot more to it than that, but I'll 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 save a more detailed plot synopsis for for reading them. for when we do an episode on the for the release of Hyper <laughs> And so that's like that I've got a full version of that now that still needs work, but I've I've got that I'm writing I'm about Maybe almost halfway through a first draft of a book that I'm currently calling AD, which can stand for Anno Domini or Auto Decapitate, which is about a man who drums up support for live streaming himself cutting off his own head and in the process may or may not accidentally become the Antichrist. May or may not. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'll leave that open, open to interpretation. But that that's a long and way. Is that away. just dot that, point form at the moment? Or Yeah, that's yep. that's just a collection of like tens of thousands of words of dot points at the moment. Cool. I know how it ends. I know major plot points and like I said, about half of it is is dot pointed out already, although I'm gonna need to revise it quite a lot. But that that's not gonna be out for years that's a long way away cool that's why i was i was asking people for recommendations on books on gnosticism on the discord because the book is becoming more and more gnostic, <laughs> more and more gnostic. as i'm writing it. <laughs> <laughs> the demiurge is becoming more and more prominent <laughs> uh lastly um no no almost lastly we're coming up on the end of my explicit questions um what uh, can you tell us a little bit about the the cover art? It's really it's really cool. Yeah, the cover art was by a friend of both of ours called David. I don't know if I, oh, actually no, his last his last name's I'm pretty sure is on his on work. His, yeah, I think he wants his yeah on his work. We so can bleep out his last Dave name Cherian. if he doesn't like it, but I think he's fine. I think he yeah. wants people to know who he is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm now going to read out his address. <laughs> yeah, um, and he's, if people can go out and start picketing the front of his house, that'd be really appreciated. Yep. Yeah, stop him from sleeping, <laughs> break into his house, steal his stuff. Well, while you're talking about it, I'm going to pull up his Instagram and we'll give him a shout out. Yeah, yeah. 
So it's a friend of ours, Dave Cherian, who has been getting more and more interested in visual art, and he's got a very, very distinctive style. If anyone's seen the the cover art for Tower, that's a pretty good that's a pretty good introduction to his broader body of work. But I really, really like his art. I thought it would be a really, really good fit for for Tower. I'd love it if in the future for future books he could do the cover art for them as well. It was a really, really nice process of being able to talk to him about what Tower is about. It's Dave it's David, so I mean no one else listening except probably Ed, if Ed's listening, shout out to Ed, will know what David's personality is like, but he's the sort of person who'll call you up ostensibly to talk about what you want for the cover art, and then two and a half hours later of him giving a, a Jungian analysis of his childhood, you'll you'll hang up. So the 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 process of coming up with the art was fun and very David as well. Yeah, he's he's you can imagine that he's maybe very the sort of man. people who are good friends of Jack and I uh maybe a little odd or whatever. And <laughs> <laughs> he's he's one of the most psychologically intense people I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> we will put a link to his Instagram in, yeah, in definitely. um this episode, but his Instagram handle is at David's artwork, um, all lowercase letters, all one word. So D A V I D S A R T W O R K. Uh, you can get a sense of like all his other work. It's it's really quite amazing. It's really great. Um, so, um, yeah, go check out his art. Uh, and I'm sure I he doesn't have any links in his bio at the moment, but I'm sure if you message him, if you're interested in buying any of his uh, originals or prints, print copies, he'd be happy for you to message him. Yeah, it's great. It's such it's strange art, and it really suits the book as well. Yeah, it's very unusual art. <laughs> <laughs> so I think this is my second last question. Um, who should? Who do you think? Obviously, everybody should read the book, <laughs> but everyone should read the book. But who? Who? Everyone who's able to pay me above market price for the book. <laughs> who should read? Who, who are you thinking would like Tower, or what sort of reader are you hoping will, will find it valuable? So it, as much as I was joking about broad appeal before, on some level, I would like as many people as possible to. Yeah, like of it. course. I'm, I not that, <laughs> I'm not that concerned about their, their demographics. One hundred million sales. <laughs> if, if, if they if they buy it and say so they like it, yeah. If so, if the entire human population could buy multiple copies, great. <laughs> the first like Decker billionaire author. <laughs> 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 yeah. I'm worth fifty billion dollars from self-publishing one. Self-publishing book. tower. When you're good, you're good. <laughs> In terms of, I guess I'm unimaginative, so I just think of the. I think of our podcast audience and hopefully my reading audience as basically me. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I guess just like s- slightly lonely people who spend too much time on the internet <laughs> is kind of just how I imagine all of our listeners and <laughs> hopefully all my readers. <laughs> Fortunately, though, there are a lot of people who spend a lot of time on the internet and probably as a result are pretty lonely. Yeah, so there's so like a, maybe you know, 5 billion people. I've picked, the, I've picked a growth demographic. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> really capitalising off that like... Uh, epidemic of loneliness and depression in, in Western civilization. <laughs> <laughs> well, the West has been generous enough to spread it to other cultures too. So hopefully like the Chinese market, I'm sure will go bananas for this. The Russian market will lap it up. Well, there is a lying flat and let it rot in China by land. Yeah. And I can't remember what let it rot is, but yeah. So the, I expect to be a huge hit with the lying flat move, <laughs> even though this is published in English. <laughs> and maybe I'll just get ChatGPT to translate it into Mandarin and become an overnight <laughs> sensation. And uh, I've got one final question, but before I ask you that, do you have any other, I guess, lingering thoughts or things to that we haven't covered? I was wanting to ask you actually, yep. what's what was you? Have you ever read a? book or particularly a work of fiction by pe- by someone that you know well because my so the first person who read a draft of this was my wife 
because she's you know, she we we live in the same household, so she can't escape me. If I just ask enough times, if she can read it, <laughs> she's going to have to eventually relent. And she said it was a very strange experience because she sees auto like autobiographical aspects of my life or our lives together run through the blender and then spat out again in a very, very strange sort of funhouse mirror form. Have you had that experience before? And what was it like reading a book by someone that you know really well? Uh, no, I don't have any other uh, anybody else in my life who has written any books and certainly not a psychedelic post-rock sci-fi fantasy post-apocalyptic thing or <laughs> whatever the hell this book is. <laughs> um, uh, no, I don't. Uh, and it was interesting as well because I know you said before like you don't see it as a psychological book, um, but I guess because I know you so well, um, I couldn't help but see like a lot of that autobiographical stuff and um, and like like a lot of your the stuff that you – went through i think like in london during lockdowns i think it definitely comes through um obviously like there's a character in there that i won't reveal but i think it is like pretty a kind of like i could pinpoint of like oh yeah i can see like the influences there <laughs> um <laughs> obviously being a doctor so i i, I get what you mean about um I think, like, it's on me to say it as a reader. Like, I think it is a, um, according to, like, Jung's classification, like a visionary text um, and rather than a psychological one. But I suppose to what you were saying, because you're writing using things from your own life and stuff, unless you just completely wrote something that had nothing to do with the real world, like, I don't know, just complete high fantasy or something, Um like this contains a lot of autobiographical, mm. if not direct things, like like at least you know it, it. I can see those autobiographical elements in there, but I, I think like overall, like I think it's it would fall into Carl Jung's visionary category of books, and um, yeah, I guess that was kind of strange because I kept on asking myself like, is this uh a manifestation of Jack psyche that I'm reading into right now, or, or am I kind of reading too much into it because I know about your life? Um, yeah, it was it was an interesting experience. Remember, actually, yeah, that's some that's that does remind me. I'm trying to remember. Was it in this version that there's a a soul pathology named after you? No, or did you I take that out? Thing. Thank thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in quite a number of drafts, <laughs> Levi had an, an eponymous soul pathology, yeah, and I think he had um one for Ed as well. Ed yeah, as well. Me and Ed were mentioned, and Rich. Oh, and Rich. Yeah, yeah, and Rich as well. <laughs> and one for Rich. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, but I I think like um um. As my, as flattering as it was to be included in your, in your text, I also think it was a good move taking those out. Because um, you have yeah. to, I guess, if you want to be parsimonious with your writing, you have to always be asking yourself, like, is this sentence or section or whatever, or even potentially a whole theme, like, is it actually adding value to the story or to the, the text? And, um, yeah, I think there are some parts in from the earlier revision that I read that were taken out, including my my name <laughs> which i thought oh yeah i think removing those things were good i think you got it down to like um the necessities rather than um having superfluous content and themes and stuff in there i thought that was good uh okay great fantastic so that's a great question um do you have any other questions for me <laughs> no not really I'll save I'll save it for when you write something because I'll be pretty surprised if you don't end up writing something on Bitcoin epistemology or Bitcoin <laughs> and epistemology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think I will end up writing stuff. Um, but I, for our listeners, oh, our listeners, I don't know, doing backroom conversation. But basically, like one of the questions that we've been asking ourselves is like, we want to do this, like, um sustainably and stuff so obviously we've got to make the finances work um and i'm working full-time at the moment and jack is um well i don't want to talk about jack's financial situation but you know he he would like to also start earning an income soon <laughs> um <laughs> but i would like to be able to earn an income without 
having to um, give somebody else 40 hours of my week. So in order to do that, we need to like figure out the financial model of what we're doing. And Jack's focusing on his writing, which I think is very good. And uh, I've decided to, instead of like getting distracted with a whole bunch of different stuff, like focus back on software because this is a pretty fucking useful skill when it comes to making money. <laughs> uh, but one day, <laughs> one day, when it, one day, um, maybe when I've like less employed and more mm. self-employed, um, I'll be able to like uh, do some writing again or like write something substantial. Um, so with that being said, um, let me see. Uh, oh, yeah. Very, very important question. Final question, if you want to have it as the final question, um, is where can people find this book? Oh, yeah. So it's it's definitely going to be on Amazon, probably going to be on iBooks, depending on how difficult Apple is, because dealing with Apple's just so much more opaque than dealing with Amazon. So definitely those two places. Abe? Not yet. I'll do that later, probably. So the biggest, the cool. the central place to find stuff on my books is it on my website. So jackbc.me, J-A-C-K-B-C.me. I'll I'll put I'll put links to like the Amazon, like where All to buy it stuff. on Amazon. Probably in every um, description of every episode of this podcast, because may as well. Uh, and it'll be available as. As an ebook and as a paperback, depending on what yeah. you want. Print on demand. Yep, print on demand. It's a wild new time. Buy the Kindle copy, buy the buy the physical copy, buy the digital copy. One day there'll be an audio copy and you should buy that as well. Yeah, doing an audio book, something I thought about. <laughs> buy six that's copies. A, that's a big give them to your friends. <laughs> give them to your friends, give them to your loved ones, give them to people you don't even know. Buy buy a hundred copies, copies give them away. And then sell them at profit. Get it out there into the culture. <laughs> Send them to people who don't even want it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, excellent job, Jack. I think you should be really proud of yourself. Um, and it's good to be finally publishing it. Um, and hopefully for those in our audience who do actually purchase the book, um, I hope they enjoy it. Do you have anything else to say? Not too much else off the top of my head. Just It's been a really, really cool. fun and rewarding experience to build up an audience by publishing podcast episodes on bizarre books. And then, and then, and yeah, then using an audience that we've built up to try to get people interested in what I've written. It's probably also, perhaps it'll be karmic. I hope not. Spent so much time talking shit about other people's books. It it only makes sense for me to provide a target for people to shoot back at. <laughs> like, talk yeah, is what cheap. if there's like a uh, yeah, talk is cheap. Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe like a reaction podcast comes up out of the ether and somebody just covers our podcast episodes and talks shit about our podcast. Look, and then if, talk shit about your if books. someone really wants to do that, I would encourage it. <laughs> if they can get as broad an audience as possible and then tell that audience about our podcast, where people can find our podcast, that would be great. That would be really, really appreciated. Yeah. So somebody create a a reaction podcast, start talking shit about us. I'm trying to think of who whose books were we meanest about, who was liable to do that. I'm kind of, well, F. Gardner never mentioned us. No. <laughs> no good on, on his YouTube channel. Uh, I can't. Oh, you know what? Like, um, I reckon uh, Varg probably wouldn't. Um, what's that guy's name who wrote Gothic Violence? Jack Ma. Mike Ma. Mike, Jack Ma. Ma. Yeah, Jack Ma. <laughs> we, I mean, if Jack Ma started, if Jack talking, Ma started shit talking about, about us, us, I'd be really happy. <laughs> I'd be really happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Mike Ma. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think, I think she'd be fine. Um, yeah, I, I I think like yeah, one last sales pitch. By the buy book. it. Um, if if this sounded interesting to you guys at all, to you at all, um, it meant a lot to Jack personally. It also meant a lot to the show um, to give us like a, a bit of market feedback in the form of not just attention but cash money. Mm. Um, if it turns out that this is actually a good way for um, Jack to be able to support himself um, by self publishing yeah, by doing something, I wonder. Getting, to- getting his books off the ground, leveraging his own audience. I think inevitably like our audience, direct podcast audience will never probably be so large that 
it, you'd be able to just sell to our audience, but I think like it's a good way to seed the initial sales of the yeah. book potentially. Yeah. Also, actually, on that note, how I, th- I think I'm going to start uploading my the notes I take for each episode to the Patreon, it's because at the moment people are giving us money on Patreon very kindly without us giving them a great deal in return. So I think that's probably another way we can, if not make money, then at least justify people spending money on us to to give them the notes we make for the <laughs> yeah, books we that read. Would be a really smart thing to do. <laughs> Shout out to the Discord. Shout out in particular to the uh, patrons. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. Well, we should let people get on with their day <laughs> <laughs> and um, enjoy whatever it is you're doing. I'm going to enjoy reading Tower again and again. I'm going to enjoy buying copies of Tower, which is probably what everyone listening to this right now should do as well. Before this. I, I also like I, if if anybody wants to send us feedback, we do check our emails occasionally. Yeah, don't have much else to say. Thanks again for reading the book. I really appreciate that. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, oh yeah, uh, if if you guys enjoyed, so there was this one last thing um, to our listeners. If you guys enjoyed a an interview style, I suppose this was I had like a lot of pre written questions that um, I sent to Jack like half an hour before so that he could at least read through them. Um, but if you guys would like interviews on the show, us to like interview authors and stuff, let us know. Like send us an email or jump on the Discord or like we, I think maybe once every six months we check our Twitter account, but you can definitely send us a <laughs> message there and we might see it like sometime in 2025, yeah. or 2026. And, <laughs> and um, yeah, let us know. And in particular, if there's a specific author that you would like, let us know. And we, um, and if you can yeah, swarm we'll, them on we'll, social media and demand that, like that you to. won't demand that they go on the podcast, that'd be really good. Just yeah. never leave them yeah, alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come to um, their house, just harass yeah. them in Minecraft. <laughs> Send them copies of Jack's book. Yeah, that's <laughs> you know that's obligatory. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm all good. I'm done. I'm done. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. See you next time.